An anonymous questioner asks what the source of holiness in the universe is. Um, I would say that a source with a capital S contains wholeness, holiness, whateverness, all. That source is consciousness per se. It is nothingness, but nothingness is not just nothing. <laughs> nothing is paradoxically also everything. So what's the source? Nothingness, which is consciousness manifesting all. Um, you know, that is wholeness. As far as holiness, that's uh, more of a feeling that is a compartmentalization when we're not living whole. When we're living partial lives, we have compartmentalized aspects of our own wholeness. Holiness is one of them. Aloha, wise ask. It's Jeremy Vaney. Um, hoping, of course, you can hear me. Who knows? Who knows with this thing, this crazy app, um, and this crazy iPad, frankly. Um, I apologize if you hear click sounds and stuff like that. I, I'm holding an iPad, and I realized after um, I decided to take some of these and use them as episodes for our undoing radio for the, the new wise ask podcast. I, uh, release on Mondays, um, that I can hear these clicking sounds, which is like just this iPad moving around in my hand. I'm going to try to try to make that not happen anymore, but who knows? Um, a lot to talk about or write about in my life right now. It's just all bottlenecking and I can't seem to pick a way to go. So now that I've clickbaited you with Alien's Death and Dalai Lama, <laughs> maybe I can get some of those things out of the way. Um, death will be in the context of uh, one of those one-minute hot take questions I received from an anonymous person asking, what happens after we die? Naturally, my hot take on that is, don't ask me, I'm alive. What would I know about that? But I've got a longer answer, <laughs> and uh, it's equally true, and uh, paradoxically true, maybe. I don't know. Um, and, of course, the Dalai Lama tongue kiss heard around the world, or not. And the uh, just something I wanted to say about the aliens. Um, so, I don't know where to start, simply because... On the one hand, no one's in here uh, live yet. I, I don't want to start saying tasty things before there's an audience. But on the other, it doesn't matter if nobody out there exists because this is going to end up a podcast, like I said, on uh, our Undoing Radio. Um, maybe I'll just start with something that I didn't put in the title <laughs> related kind of to aliens, which is time travel. Because interestingly... I just got done uh, this morning editing um, my show for Dreamland, which is one of the podcasts I host. I, I host it monthly for Whitley Strieber. Um, so my episode will be out uh, at the end of the month. So I think Friday, April 28th, I believe. And it is an interview with Michael P. Masters. Um who, I don't remember what his science-y title is, but he's a professor, a tenured professor, and he uh, he specializes in physiology of some sort and has applied that to just like, you know, what people claim to be aliens uh, in a series of books. This first book, he concentrated on the greys. It's interesting in that he didn't really know anything about ufology or alien abductions. Um, Except that, like, you know, I guess he saw the cover of his parents' book, Communion, and that intrigued him. And so he just thought, like, greys were all people reported. And then after he wrote his first book, he delved into the material that he arguably should have been delving into all along before he wrote a book and saw that there were a whole bunch of different types of beings, including humans. But based on the greys in the first book, and then, of course, humanoid, humanish type humanoids, uh, later, um, you know, he's basically trying to say that maybe they're time travelers. And here's why, based on their physiology, this is kind of what future humans might end up looking like. 
which doesn't interest me so much, but does interest the audience. And it's something that I can uh, sink my fangs into a little bit. And I'd seen him in interviews, and he was a good interview. Um, he certainly can speak, and so he could do all the heavy lifting. This is what I thought going into the interview, and, and certainly that's all correct, but some pleasant surprise happened, which is like we're talking about his second book now, and apparently there's a third one on the way later this year. Um, and he's sort of changing his mind. Like the more he looks into the UFO literature, the more he's sort of finds himself attracted to the idea that these are more tricksterish phenomena, more ephemeral, less solid, uh, more of a mystery in other words than mere time travelers or even aliens. And I really appreciate that. And so in the first half of the you know, for the non-subscribers interview uh, for Dreamland, we talk about his book and we talk about time travel and we get into all of that. But then I saw that he was open to the idea, thankfully, of like going down a different road. And so I brought him down a different road for subscribers and he was all too willing to go there with me, which really has to do with like l less talking about the universe in cold mechanical terms and more about, hey, what about the aliveness of the universe? How does that factor into for instance, time travel. Um, you know, if essentially he's using the block universe theory, which is like everything, which I agree with, which I've experienced firsthand, that everything is just sort of one giant picture already, always already happening. Let's, I'll use the Ken Wilber phraseology. Everything is always already happening. So since that is true, who is there to travel and are they not already part of the picture? You know, so we get into these sorts of questions. And then for me, the ultimate question, like w once you have that type of mind, once you are a non dual mind, um, what's the point? <laughs> why travel anywhere? Why, why go anywhere? And he was really game for these questions. And so I really appreciated it. Naturally we had technical issues, which has taken me forever to, you know, edit this thing. Uh, which I think might have been StreamYard that we were using partly and maybe partly our own internet connections. I don't know. But like, you know, it's the type of thing, like once we start getting into the, the deep weeds of spirituality, suddenly my camera turns off and then my side camera turns on, unbeknownst to me. And then that was the camera that was on for like, I don't know, the last third or so of the interview. Um, and meanwhile, like we were recording locally to our computers and thankfully StreamYard by default also records uh, to the cloud. So his local computer only uh, recorded about half of it and then wouldn't record anymore. So it was a lot, it's a lot of editing different camera angles and audio and trying to get it to look okay, essentially for me. Um, but I think it's going to be worth it. I actually uh, think that this will be the, Dreamline audience's favorite interview that I've done so far, um, which isn't saying much because I think they mainly hate me, which is fine because I mainly loathe them. So <laughs> it works out when you don't like your audience. Uh, and I don't, it's like weird. It's like changed. It's, uh, and part of it is the YouTube crowd. Part of it is that the free, the people who watch the free portion on YouTube which is a new thing, you know, Whitley Streber used to just do audio and now he does video and audio podcasting. And so I have to do video and audio podcasting and, you know, anything you put on YouTube for free to a large audience, like Whitley has a large following, uh, it's going to be a lot of morons and, you know, people who claim to love Whitley, but don't know how to spell his name, you know, those people, um, and people who hate me because I'm not Whitley. <laughs> Which are often the same people. Uh, so it's a lot of vitriol coming my way there. But then also his subscriber base. I don't know what happened to them, but at least when I was doing the experience for Whitley, for Dreamland, it was sort of the opposite. Like it was a lot of really, uh, if not good thinkers, at least open minds. And then, you know, of course you're going to get riffraff. But you're also going to get legit criticism, and I'm not saying that everyone's criticism of me is is 
garbage. And like, I'm immune to criticism. But I'm saying if you know anything about YouTube, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a lot of trolls. Uh, but it seems as though that there's a lot of that in the Dreamland audience now. And maybe they were always there and they just weren't as vocal. I don't know. But again, it's people who claim to love him and not know who I am and where did you find this guy. But meanwhile, I've had a show on his website since 2015. So that's weird. But also, like, you know, uh, just people who want the campfire stories of aliens, alien abductions, and all that stuff. And I'm done with campfire stories. Uh, I don't care about that. That's not what this phenomenon is about. And, you know, presumably, Dreamland is a place for more serious inquiry. And so I, I hope that that crowd is just uh, is still there, but not vocal. I don't mind if I'll, I'll take the the you know the slings and arrows as long as I know that there are good people listening. And I've seen a few comments that indicate that they're there; they're just quiet. So that's fine. That's worth it to me still. Um, but regardless, it's like you know when you don't get paid for something. <laughs> And you're, you're helping out a friend. Uh, you don't want to get crapped on constantly by people. Um, and especially people like, because I can't answer back to them because it's not my show, right? Like I'm just a guest host. So I don't feel like it's my place to answer every single comment. In fact, I just feel like I should just bow out, put my head down, do the work and that's it. Not respond to anybody. Um, so that's that, but nevertheless, Next episode is about time travel. And um, I have a friend who's writing a book, and uh, I am featured fairly prominently in the book, which is new to me. Um, uh, and he's adding something about time travel. So we, we got into this back and forth about time travel um, right while I'm editing this show on time travel. So it's a nice little synchronicity. And... Uh, his question is, you know, in my last couple of books, I've really harped on the idea of alien abduction, um, the main motifs having to do with colonialism and um, racism. That there, you know, I, I, there is a phenomenon there with a real intelligence, but either they or we, and probably some combination of both, have, uh, you know, essentially they mirror back to us what we project onto them. And so, you know, that can always just only be us doing that. Right. Um, but however it works out, if you look at just sort of the motif of an alien abduction of like alien overlords coming here to make hybrids, they steal our white women, right. And they make babies and you know, you, you go down the list of, these are all the things that like white Americans fear. Um, and I had said, you know, and that's true, whether it's, uh, you put the alien mask on it or interdimensional mask on it or time travel mask on it. And he was saying he didn't, he wasn't so sure about time travel. And ultimately I think I won, I won him over <laughs> because really to me, it doesn't, it's like, it doesn't matter. Like the time you can say time travelers, you can suppose that alien abductions are time travelers coming back to like fix the timeline, although they never seem to fix anything. Right. They haven't done anything about Hitler. Uh, we still have nukes. We're still looting ourselves to death. You know, you go down the list of things, they're not fixing anything. And if they're just here with popcorn to watch the show uh, as we turn the screw to ourselves, that doesn't, you know, okay, great. Um, then why are they interacting with us? Because my point is that you can say the word time traveler, but what you really mean is alien abduction because I have yet to hear anyone say uh like there's this cognitive dissonance right like an alien abduction story of the alien doctor that we all know and love the medical exam and the all of that stuff the hybrid or the taking of sperm and eggs and all of that um that is the story people are talking about when they talk when they just say time travelers instead of aliens or when they say interdimensional instead of aliens that's the general story and so it doesn't matter what word you put on it. <laughs> the story is the story and the story is a uh, deep fear um, or regret or whatever of them being like us, uh, them being our worst selves. 
Um, and it is interesting, like, because the other thing that he was talking about is like mantis beings. There are, you know, positive mantis being stories and all that. But the one that sticks, I, th- I think if you ask anyone, if you took a poll in ufology and said, what is, what is the role, what is the function of a mantis being as opposed to a gray? They'd say the mantis being is an overseer and the gray is a worker bee. Like there ain't no love and light there. That's, that's the story that sticks. So in other words, it doesn't even matter. And I found this through telling my own experiences. I found this through interviewing other experiencers. It doesn't matter what we say our experiences are. The public has it in their head, the story, and they want that story to be the case. Part of it is that they've had it promoted at them. The other part is that it appeals to them, which is why it sticks, right? And so whatever comes out of my mouth just sounds like blah, blah, aliens, blah, blah, UFO. Therefore, he's talking about aliens and UFOs in the context that I agree it happens, which is what I've read. Right? So they're not even hearing what we're actually saying. They're just putting it in, into the frame of story that they've already got. Uh, and that's, that's annoying, <laughs> but it's just a fact of life. Um, so I guess just one thing I wanted to say about being an experiencer in that sense is, um, You know, I'm as guilty of calling myself an alien abductee and talking about myself as an an experiencer and talking about my experiences as though they're compartmentalized, you know, sort of one-off aberrations because that's kind of what you do in interviews and stuff. And it's kind of what you do to pick apart in books, your own experiences. And it's the language that we all understand. So I've always sort of said that, like, I, you know, I'm an experiencer. I'm not really an alien abductee, but I don't care if you call me an alien abductee because we, at least we all know what we're talking about. Now I can convince you that there's neither aliens nor abduction involved. But the point is, like, we do need to change the language of this because I'm not an abductee. Aliens don't exist. And when I say that, people get up in arms, but it's just true. There is no such thing as an alien. And there's a nuance to that answer, and I've talked about it you know, elsewhere, and I've written about it in my books, and um, I, the, the general gist is that whether there are beings that come here from another planet or not, the term alien and the meaning behind an alien as this separate, other, cold, you know, whatever, foreign entity – is a Western sort of divide and conquer mentality um, concept. Uh, So in other words, I mean, if you come from like a nature culture, there's no such thing as an alien. Everyone is family and not just like space brothers and stuff, but like all the nations of earth from insects to plants, to animals, to people, everyone's family, rocks, everyone's family, planets, family this inclusivity as opposed to exclusivity. Um, I, that's hugely important to recognize that because that means there's no such thing as an alien. Like if we were living naturally, we would not have the concept of an alien. It wouldn't be in us. It wouldn't be in our language and we wouldn't be obsessing about, you know, evil aliens <laughs> and what evil looks like and what that evil looks like is exactly what we do and or have done. So, you know, ponder that a moment, folks. Um, so that that's one thing. Uh, there's no such thing as an alien, and that's whether there are people on other planets or not. Now, uh, also, I, I guess just sort of as I was saying, I'm not an experiencer who's had a lifetime of experiences, which is what experiencer implies. Not that I haven't had a lifetime of these experiences, but what I mean is, when you say you're an experiencer, when you talk about these as compartmentalized events of high strangeness or paranormal activity or UFO activity, it makes it sound like they are just that compartmentalized episodes and not like a part of the stream of my life. Right. And so when we talk about normal experiences in our lives, we all understand that we're picking out of the stream, some story that's funny or has heart or is horrifying or like some accomplishment you know, that time you caught the, the great pass in football or the time you slipped on a banana peel and everyone laughed, you know, whatever it is. 
there's this like acknowledgement it's not, or uh, you know un- understanding i guess more than acknowledgement but in just an in, in any understanding that what you're talking about is uh one of many events that comprise you right these are the stories of you that you're telling and when you tell them they they bubble up out of the stream and for a second but then they go back down but it seems like with when we talk about our experiences of the paranormal and stuff like that they never go back down we talk about them as though they're just puzzle pieces and we have to scrutinize them and we have to debunk them or um validate them or what however it is we feel about them but we treat them like objects outside of ourselves our own experiences right uh and there's they're not an aberration right they're not an intrusion upon our lives but they become that when we talk about them in isolation which getting back to the word alien which is an isolationist word right um, but how can they be that when they're actually part of the flow of our lives? I mean, unless you've had a one-off experience and no other paranormal experiences. And I don't know, I don't know if I know anyone who has, I know people who have claimed it until I've talked to them for about 15 minutes. <laughs> and then they're like, oh yeah, I remember this and this other time and this other weird thing I never connected. But I suppose it's possible that there's someone out there, a bunch of people who have had just one-off experiences. Hold on, I'm going to cough for a second. <coughs> My apologies. Um, but in the main, you know, experiencers have a lifelong, uh, uh, you know, sort of bunch of stuff that happens. That is that is our lives, in other words. Just as much as any ordinary story is also our lives. And so I think we need to start seeing it that way. Um, because, you know, you've probably heard it said before, they aren't strange that it's not paranormal. It's normal. It's just that we don't see it that way. But, and that's kind of what I'm saying, except I think there's something uh, that even those of us who say that and who acknowledge that still keep the note, the isolationist notion alive in our language and in the way we deal with it. And I don't know that there's a good answer to that, except just to be conscious of it, you know? Um, so that it doesn't sound like we're just telling campfire stories. Like the campfire stories are me just as the, you know, normal sort of achievement stories and folly stories of my life are also me. Uh, it's all me. You're all you, right? <laughs> so I, I guess when you see it that way, again, the idea of this being alien of this being something from somewhere else even is kind of reduced because um, how can it be when it's here in your life uh, for your entire life? I mean, we like to imagine that there, that there are beings who like fiddle with you, communicate with you, extract things from you, whatever it is, whatever it is you think is happening to you. And then they go about their business and then they come back a couple of times, you know, but it ain't that that is not true. Um, so, you know, and if it is that for them, it isn't that for you. Like it is your life. If something happens to you at a young age, as a teenager, as a young adult, and then older, that's your life. <laughs> they're there throughout your entire life, whether they go away or not. They're certainly, uh, not just impacting you in that moment, but occupying your mind space because, really what choices an experiencer have except to ponder their experiences constantly. Um, there's no choice. This is mystery and it's knocking at your door all the time. Like, what are you going to do? Um, so that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, that's aliens folks. That's aliens. Now, I, before I get to death, I, the Dalai Lama thing. Oh man, the Dalai Lama with the tongue <laughs> suck my tongue. Um, so, you know, I uh, defended, I think, fairly coherently uh, Michael Jackson from his allegations. And so I don't want to be the guy who has to defend the Dalai Lama because then it looks like, wait a minute, what's up with Vaney? Um, but I am suspicious that that this isn't a cultural mistranslation 
uh, what happened with the Dalai Lama and the little boy. And I, and I know that even saying that is like, yeah, but he still said, suck my tongue. And the little boy in the video, it looked like he was going to do it, but I just saw Vice, uh, which is a funny name for an outlet, for a news outlet on this story, but yes, Vice, just posted an article with a longer version of the clip. And the boy does not suck the Dalai Lama's tongue. The boy laughs and puts his forehead to the Dalai Lama's forehead, and then the Dalai Lama gives him another hug, and he starts lecturing him on doing good in the world and not causing war and, and all of this. And the article is basically saying that, um, you know, this is something that happened a month ago. Why is it coming out now? Why you know, They don't say this, but I'll say it. Why is it edited the way it is? Uh, and that it, essentially the people promoting it are Chinese um, government uh, stooges, basically. This is what the Vi- I, Vice article is saying, and that in uh, – in Tibet, I guess, uh, they do, there is like sticking out your tongue to greet each other sort of a thing. And Dalai Lama is a cringy, you know, sometimes he's cringy because he says things in English that are mistranslations of what he actually means to say. I guess I can sort of buy that <laughs> because unless like a bunch of kids come forward and they're like, no, he, he molested me or something, then that would be something. Now, I know that that's difficult because he's a big, powerful figure in the world, and the odds of that happening, even if it were true, are pretty minuscule. So, it, you know, I'm just saying, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a question mark on whether that was uh, inappropriate or if I just don't know anything about the culture. Plus, the Dalai Lama should know better than to say things in English when he's not a master of the English language. <laughs> That come to like anything that can be misconstrued as sexualization or even do that on camera. Although I guess doing that on camera and in front of a crowd should indicate that it was misconstrued. But even so, he should, you know, Mr. Self-Awareness here, the Dalai Lama, Mr. No Self, Go Beyond the Self Dalai Lama, should have at least a modicum of self-awareness to not even tempt the fates in this time of ours where everyone's like, uh, you know, forming cults around false QAnon, you know, uh, anti pedophile stuff. You know what I mean? Like, why would he, uh, he's stupid. In other words, if anything, the least thing he was in this situation is stupid. The most is the worst thing you can think of, but I will, I just wanted to share with you, um, a friend of mine who knows such things, <laughs> uh, I asked him what he thinks of what happened with the Dalai Lama. And I won't name this friend because he's, you know, some of you might know him. And I haven't asked him if I, if I could talk about this or not. But I, I think it's fascinating. I said, what did you think of the Dalai Lama video? And he said, I have not watched it, but I suspect he's trying to renew his energies through a sublimated sexual act with some Tibetan symbolic order. Huh. That's, you won't find that in the Vice article. <laughs> I'm going to disagree, <laughs> but uh, what do I know? I'm not uh, the Dalai Lama, I'm not Tibetan, and I'm not a Buddhist. So, uh, I know nothing. Speaking of things I know nothing about, let's go one more. Um, this is the last topic of the day, which is uh, what happens after we die? Which, for some reason, one of you out there anonymously um, asked me me for a one-minute hot take, which again, I find hilarious, because uh, how do you have a hot take on, like, what happens after you die? (laughs) That's going to be valid. Uh, Outside of, like, if you're you know, religious, you're like, well, you go to heaven. Mm, You go to hell. The end. An anonymous soul asks, what happens after you die? Um, why are you asking me? I'm alive. Like, really, why would you trust anyone who's alive to tell you what happens after you die? Uh, that's one answer. And the other one is a lot longer, so maybe I'll do an episode about it. Thanks for the question. I, I wish I could sum it up in a minute. Um, but it's a bit of an exploratory journey that we both have to take together. Let's do that.
But like I said in the hot take, I am alive. And so why would you ask me? And that flippant answer actually has sort of a, a deeper meaning there for you, which is why are we uh, so obsessed with finding out what happens after we die? Not even what, if anything, it's just even saying what happens is the presumption of something happening. But we never really question the first thing, which is, who is it that's alive? What does it mean to be alive? So the, the body, obviously, the organism that you are, is alive. And when that organism dies, uh, that's it. Now, you can say, well, it takes on other forms. You'll eventually, you know, become dust and you'll become some sort of other form of matter and energy and you'll go on into the universe and we're all stardust after all. Okay, that's fine. But essentially you're dead. <laughs> you can say that, but you're dead. Um, the, the other part of it then is this, this person called you. And that's what you really mean, right? Like what happens to this self-awareness? when the body is no more. Who is that self-awareness? And if you tackle this question with the right depth and nuance, perhaps you'll find out while the body is alive what death is, what happens after death. Tackling the idea of who it is that's actually alive. Um, who are you? Are you some witness who has thoughts and has feelings and does actions in the world? Or is that something that is a mistaken identity and that actually you don't have thoughts, but you are those thoughts. You are those emotional reactions. And well, you are those emotions. You are those reactions. You're not actually action. You're reaction. Which is the case? Uh, the thinker as a separate entity or the thought that believes it's a thinker actually being a splintered off other thought? Just the one who says, I am, I exist. But that that's actually another thought. You can see that the, the latter is the actual case when you strip away all thought and reaction and emotion. There ain't nothing left. There is no you there. Um, you are that in motion. That's you. And so, if you strip away all of that and there's nothing, isn't that death? And so, isn't that something that can be understood while you're actually, while the body is alive? Can the body not project this thought that believes it's a thinker by you who's listening to this as that thought who thinks you're a thinker hearing this and then deconstructing yourself doing positive negation as i've talked about on previous episode pairing back all your layers of motivation and, and desire and all of it and just seeing what's left or not even seeing what's left just what's left if anything is left will be the case and that case ain't you as you're constructed now because that's the thing that you just took away <laughs> right that's the thing that you just stripped off and if that all sounds convoluted i mean we sort of try to do this with psychotherapy right like the idea is you work on your issues Unfortunately, they frame it this way. You are a person who has psychological issues. And you work on those issues and you heal the inner child and all of that. And it's like a burden is lifted. You become lighter. You become different, more positive, more affirming in life, right? All these good things. So that's one way to see it. I would just say that that's not far enough because the you who is working on those issues. Of course, you need to be healthy enough to be able to hear this. But once you are healthy enough to hear this, please do hear this. That person working on those issues also has to go. 
that person working on those issues who is feeling much better and thinks like this has to be it because I'm feeling better. That person is the self uh, and is also to be pared back completely, peeled away all the layers of the onion until there's no more onion. And then you don't stink. <laughs> I don't know. I'm <laughs> it's pretty much the worst guru ever. Uh, thank God I'm not a guru folks. There'd be problems. But if, I mean, if that makes sense, then just sit with that and see, and see what happens because I could tell you what, uh, I could tell you what happens when you die or what I think happens. And then, but what, what use is that to you? It's just going to be a fantasy, whether it's true or not, it's going to be another thought to occupy you and for you to say, well, I'm not that thought, but I'm thinking about that thought and I am accepting or rejecting that thought. I'll tell it to you if you want and you can have this fantasy too. <laughs> you can accept or reject it. But uh, I suspect that it ultimately, you know, that life is getting back to the time travel thing. Um, the block universe. Now, this is something that Michael Masters had talked about in our interview. That it, For those of you who are listening now, in the beginning of this, I was talking about time travel and Michael Masters, who is a time travel theorist. And uh, he was talking about the block universe, which sounds suspiciously like what I, what, what I experienced and what I know to be true. Um, but since I'm not a physicist, I don't really know all of what goes into block theory. But this part of it is true. That essentially there is only now. There is all time is contained within the now, uh, and so everything has all is always already happening. That is the state of the universe, and so we experience, you know, past, present, future, but really they already exist. So whatever happens when you die already exists. <laughs> it's already happened. You're you haven't experienced your own death yet, but you're going you're going to. It's already happened. And you know this because in a way, in a weird way, because it is inevitable, right? Like there's two things you know in life. You're alive right now, and at some point you're going to die. Therefore, you are predestined to die. Therefore, you may have all you may have may as well already died. It's gonna happen. So it's already happened. Uh does that make sense? Like, really think about that. I know it's like a bit of a brain twister. And, but it's one way to look at it. Like, it's already destined to happen, therefore it has already happened. Um, now I don't know that that is, um, literally true. Like, I, but as an analogy of how nowness is the case, it's true. Um, therefore it's true either way. <laughs> so, I mean, it just is true. So, the question to me isn't like what happens when you die. The question is, can you get out of that? Because whatever happens is still of the universe. You may not be in the, you know, experiencing the physical universe as a person here, you know, as a human anymore. You may be a ghost or a spirit or whatever. But that just means that you're in the underbelly of the universe. You're in the, the underworld or whatever you want to call that. You're still in the universe. And if you reincarnate, if there is such a thing as reincarnation, well, then you just reincarnate and you're also back in the universe. So any way you look at it, you're in this thought construct that is either materialized or immaterial called the universe. And it's all of the universe. And the question is, is there anything that is timeless? Is there anything that is apart from the universe? Because that would be authentic death. If you were to just die and go through the motions, at, just as you're living and going through the motions, well, that's still you stuck on the Ferris wheel, right? Uh, or the merry-go-round, or whatever, whatever carnival ride you enjoy. That's what you're on. Um, so I think most people, when they die, are going to experience um, more of the carnival ride of, of being alive and being partial uh not being whole wholeness is a whole other thing 
And truth is a whole, is wholeness and is that whole other thing. And, uh, it is a parallel stream to the universe, to time. It is timelessness. It's a parallel stream. Let's call it that. How do we jump to the parallel stream? Well, you can't get there. You can't get to the timeless through time. Lord knows we've all tried, right? We've got these religious paths. Hell, the Dalai Lama. Look, I'm tying it all together. <laughs> uh, we've got, you know, substitute timelessness called ancient paths. The ancient as timelessness. And it isn't true. What the ancient paths, what all the paths, in fact, bring you to is more thought constructs, replicas of timelessness, recreations of the timeless moment in time. And you can call these archetypal, you can call these the underworld, you can call these uh, religious epiphanies, spiritual epiphanies, all of that stuff. Um, what I'm saying is there are two versions of that. One is of time and one is authentic timelessness. And it's very hard to tell the difference. Nevertheless, the way out of having to even tell the difference is to be timelessness. And how does one be timelessness? By a little stripping away, again, the layers of your own psychology, which is you. You are time. You are a thought. You're a thought construct. You are a projection of the brain, taking from the past, modifying it in the present, and projecting a future and reaching toward that. And when that mechanistic you is dissolved, timelessness is the case. Therefore, truth is the case. Therefore, non-duality, oneness, consciousness per se is the case. In which, not just you, not just your, your pals next to you, but the entire universe is contained within that, if you want to call it that. That this non-dual timelessness transcends and includes time. Um, which isn't to say that it has a direct personal relationship with it or with you. <laughs> you know, like there is no personal God coming in you know, guardian angels or any of that stuff and helping you out. We're talking about impersonal love. You are that. You are that isness. And that isness is consciousness per se. And when you, as a self aware entity, as the self awareness, are that self awareness, there is no duality. You are that. Um, and that is your personal consciousness. So that is how the impersonal becomes personal, not as an entity who comes and lends you a hand, but you are the personal uh, aspect of the impersonal consciousness. So when the self is out of the way, the impersonal, essentially, timelessness uh, shines through the vessel of the body, comes into time, um, and, you know, is also, you know, projects out as the persona, as the person, as you through time. <sighs> that's a lot. And you don't have to suck the Dalai Lama's tongue to, to get there. So that's the good news. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what happens after death? Hopefully not sucking on the Dalai Lama's tongue. Uh, <laughs> what happens after death is, I mean, if it's a continuity, if what you're asking is, is there continuity after death? And believing that nothing happens when you die, as an atheist uh, or whatever, and whoever else believes, a humanist, whatever, um, is still continuity. It's your own continuity right here, right now. It's you being able to block out the question with an answer when the real answer is you don't know. Uh, and not the flippant you don't know of agnosticism, like, well, I don't know, so I'm going to throw my hands up and just not broach the question. But there's a genuine not knowingness that when it strikes your core, destroys you. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I mean, some people experience this for a moment, uh, and it changes them forever, or it changes them for a day, <laughs> depending on uh, how crappy the rest of your day is going. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but do you, do you understand what I'm saying? That there are, it, it just sucks because we've got words 
that we use that are both contain both a, a shallow and a shallowness and a depth to them. And we generally use the shallow definition. We're generally talking in shallowness, but there is a secret depth there that is also there that can be engaged with. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to engage with here. Uh, depth, but through the shallows. <laughs> so good luck with that. And me. Oh, Oh me. So anyway, <laughs> getting back to the point, uh, if you, if what your question is, is there continuity after life? Um, then my question back to you is, if there is continuity after life, if you go on in some form, then there is no such thing as death. And if there is no such thing as death, then you're still in the universe. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just is what it is. You're in the illusion. But to fully understand that death isn't just like, my body dies and I go on. It's the thing you fear most, complete, total annihilation. Fear it so much that if you're an atheist, you will, again, flippantly say, or an agnostic, you know, you'll, as an atheist, you'll flippantly say, well, there is nothing. I just don't believe there's anything. And if you're an agnostic, you say, nah, I don't know, so I won't engage with it. I, I put the question aside. Uh, how astute. Well, the core of you knows what you are. And you will avoid it at all costs because to deal with what you, you are, to actually mature from that, grow up from that, really to not even grow up or not in the sense of evolution, but in the sense of transformation, of chewing through the cocoon and being the butterfly, that takes self-annihilation. That doesn't, you know, that's the thing that we fear the most. And so we'll find our continuity where we can take it, whether it be through a religion, through our own personal, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, or through the supposition that nothing happens at all. Because in all cases, this is guesswork. And putting it aside uh, for a rainy day is, um, while it seems the logical, rational thing to do, is actually is actually another way to run from the, you know, the fear of annihilation. And if you just, I don't know, sit with all of this, just sit with it, see what happens, sit with it in depth and alone, because also <laughs> let's add this, even though we're having a conversation and you're listening to some dude talk to you about this, it's not a communal experience. This, this, death or annihilation of self while the body is alive. It's you. You have to be the one to confront this, to understand this. Uh, I could be lying. I could someday stick my tongue out and say, suck my tongue, just like the Dalai Lama, and then be suspect. So, yes, I'm the one saying this to you right now. And yes, somebody has to say it uh, to, to make us all conscious of it. But even that person has to go. I, unfortunately for me, um, can't be the crutch for you, can't be the guru, can't be the teacher, can, should be, um, you should be skeptical of me, but not skeptical, I would, I would argue, in the sense that you just, like an agnostic, say, eh, I can't know, so I'll just throw it away and move on, or I'll find something else that's more appealing. But skeptical in the way of find out for yourself. This is your life. Do you want to know? Are you sure? <laughs>